Welcome to this demo of Semex Device Model Building. What we're going to do is this. We're going to take an existing target system and we're going to add a new device to it. The new device is modeled from the programming guide. We're going to do a transaction level model which describes the what of the device and not how it's actually done, which basically means we need to model the inputs, the outputs, the programming registers in the device and how they relate to each other. The setup looks like this. We have an existing machine consisting of a dual core arm, we have an intra controller and we have some basic devices like memory flash, a serial port, real-time clock timer and also Ethernet which we won't be using. And we're extending this machine with a single new device which controls a bunch of LEDs and a button and we connect that device both to the memory map of the target system and the interrupt controller and we also connect it out to a simulation of its input output panel with four LEDs and a button. The uh, process we're going to go through is essentially this. We start with the specification for the new device and the existing machine. We then build a device skeleton for the new device. We add that to the existing machine by extending it so we create a first version of our new machine. We then run some system tests on this. We then set up unit tests for the device and using the unit test we develop a complete device model. Once that device model is complete we rerun the system tests you know, within the scope of the extended machine and once all the system tests pass we say that we are done. This means we have a complete new device and a complete new machine. Hi, in this movie we will show you how device modeling works in Windriver Semex. The particular case we will be looking at is adding a new device to an existing system and we will discuss the methodology around that a bit as well. The device we're going to add looks like this. It's a simple LED controller with four outputs driving different LEDs, a button which eventually drives an interrupt towards a host processor as well as a memory bus connection. It also has eight registers in its memory map which are summarized in this table. The first thing we do is to create a device skeleton based on the specification. This skeleton looks like this. You declare outgoing and inbound signals and then you define the registers with size and offset but nothing else and we just say they're all unimplemented. This skeleton code is sufficient to actually integrate the device into the machine. The integration into the machine is done using a Simix component. Simix components are written in Python and here is how we add this new device to the existing machine. First we instantiate the old machine then we create a new instance of our device and finally we add it to the memory map of the system and we point it at the interrupt controller in the system. Next let's test our skeleton device with the driver software we wanted to work with. So we start a new sim session which will start the system we're working on along with the Weeksworks kernel and a driver for our little device. The test system is uh, shown here. All the white devices are the ones which actually are part of the original system. The blue one is our new device. And up here you can see a simple system panel representing the LEDs and the button. If we look at the memory mappings of the system we can see that as far as Simix is concerned this thing is mapped in the location we wanted it to be mapped. If we look at the device registers of our new device, we can see that all the registers are zero since they're all unimplemented. And if we have a look at the target system, it's now up and we can see that something failed. It actually said that we failed to find the LED device. Okay, so maybe we didn't map it in the right place. So let's see if there's any error message we can get. On the Simix console, we find this message which basically tells us that the software did indeed read from our device model. 
but it hit an unimplemented register, which means we need to implement that register to make the software happy, and it returned a zero. Since this was the version register, maybe something wasn't entirely right with that register. If you remember, the specification said it should have a value of coffee initially. Okay, now it's time to go back and start filling in the blanks in our skeleton device. The way we recommend people to do this with Simex is to first define a set of unit tests for the device, which test individual parts of functionality so they can easily and quickly be retested before you actually move on to retest this with software. If you look at the tests we have defined for this particular device, we have four tests button input output, info status, lead output, and version register. The lead output is a typical test we use to test the functionality. We first create a uh, setup with some scaffolding to run the test, and then we run a test where we basically check that the output signal for an LED is zero. We write the controlling register to one, check that the output goes to one, write the controlling to zero, and check that the output is point back down to zero. So these are the kinds of unit tests we use to check that a particular aspect of functionality of the device actually works as it should. So if we run these tests for our skeleton device, we would not expect very many of them to pass because we have not actually implemented any functionality yet. And that's exactly the case, except for the interesting case of info status. But info status is kind of a special test that checks that our device has defined the standard info and status commands that all Simex device models are supposed to define. Info basically provides a way to describe the static setup of the device to the user through the either actually the GUI or the command line, and status gives you a snapshot of the current dynamic state of the device in a nice human readable form. Let's uh, skip ahead in the modeling process now because we actually have a partial device model already done which we can use so let's use that one instead and rebuild you can see this recompiling so if you look at this partial device model we can see that it has much more functionality inside of it so we we'll basically spend a few hours coding here And let's see how this one fares when we run the tests on it. So we rerun the tests. Let's quickly wait for the results. And this looks better, right? Now only three out of four tests pass, but that's still pretty okay. So maybe we should go and test run this with the software anyway, because at least some things do seem to be passing, so we might actually get a bit further and see if there's anything kind of misunderstood or so. Let's rerun our test with the software. So we start a new Simix session, started booting. We check that things are still looking good. We see the device register. Okay, so this one now has um, the expected value. So maybe the software would like this better than did the last variant of the device. And if we check what the software says, it actually did initialize the driver and it's waiting for something to happen. So let's go to the system panel where we can see that now an LED is actually lit. This looks good. We press the button once. That also looks good. The software says, hmm, this looks nice. But we press the button again and nothing happens. So this is probably the issue that our unit test found, which the software actually didn't care to check for. Back in modeling, it is time to implement that last missing piece of functionality. It is actually right here in the source code where we have a little to-do in place. And what we need to do is that first of all, let's check that we do have an interrupt raised. And if we don't, we log an error. We 
actually is not a good idea. So we make sure that if someone writes a buggy driver, we catch it and tell them. That's always a nice service from a device model. And to actually lower the device, interrupt. Follow function. And we must not forget to actually change the stat of this little bit as well. So that should be it. Let's rebuild. Okay. Now it's been rebuilt. And then we rerun our tests to make sure that the test now pass. Yes, all tests passed. And then we can go to test run and see if we can actually successfully run our software this time around. So we bring up the system. This time there's no point in going around and watching memory mappings or anything because this should just work. I mean, we know that part is solid. The Wakesworks comes up and the device driver says the same thing as last time, waiting for first button. So we press and it says very good. And now we press again. And now look, more things happen. So I guess this proves that finally we have a device that actually satisfy the device driver and the specification. To recap, this is what we did in this demo. We built a new device, we added it to an existing machine, we walked through the modeling process you employ with Simex, we took a device from a skeleton to a complete device, we did some system tests on a complete system, and we used unit tests on the individual device to drive the modeling. We showed how you code in DML to build a device model. We showed the Python language coding used for Simex components, which kind of connect up the system, the test cases, and the custom device commands. There were some parts of the Simex Eclipse interface we did not show, such as the menu items to create new Simex modules and devices and scripts, the new Simex module and the new Simex device wizard, which helps you quickly create a skeleton of a device, as well as the sample device viewer where you can have a look at the example code that comes with Simex without creating any modules actually based off of these sample devices. Thank you.